so welcome, as I was telling you, to this uh, uh, webinar open to public organized by the Sustainability and Higher Education Initiative, which is uh, uh, a new initiative from uh, the Bartlett School of Energy, Environment and Resources at UCL. With our initiative, uh, we aim to um, uh, discuss on uh, sustainability and higher education, linking teaching, research, outreach, and external opportunities, and connect at the same time our students, our staff, the public, and our alumni, which is now a very large network of thousands of, uh, of people uh, um, involved uh, mostly in uh, sustainability. Um, just some uh, uh, quick uh, rules before starting. So we will have four speakers, four presentations from four different programs within Bizir. Uh, we will collect questions uh, um, on uh, on the Q and A session. So Q and A uh, the button that you can say you can see here at the very bottom. After the presentations, we will discuss uh, the questions you raise. Uh, for Beatrice, we will email her as she has um, a, a very important uh, um, uh, duty later on. Okay, um, just a, another couple of uh, information. If you want to hear more about our sustainability initiative, uh, uh, thank you, Nikos. Uh, so we have uh, added uh, the link uh, on the webinar chat. And at the same time, uh, we will write down also here the link for all our MSc programs. Yeah, We have a very long list of programs now uh, divided in our four institutes. And uh, most of them, or if not all, uh, touch sustainability at some point. So they're all very relevant from a very a different perspective, of course. Okay, so great. Uh, I think we are ready to start. Uh, and uh, I would like to um, invite Beatrice to unmute. And uh, um, Beatrice, uh, you, uh, um, you are um, free to share uh, your slides and uh, good luck with the presentation. Okay, thank you. So um, every, I think everyone see the screen, right? It's all good. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, and I'm Beatrice, and I was a MSc Light and Lighting student, and here is my dissertation topic. Uh, thanks for the invitation for this presentation. And oops, sorry. Um, so um, I would like to present my uh, uh, dissertation. It's about the lighting sensitivity between the neurotypical and neurodivergence populations using LED in their office. And uh, my supervisor is Jemima and Peter, and also with Ruth. So um, I really thank you about this about this research because this is the uh, neuro uh, the NDTI I worked with the um, national development team uh, for uh, institutions. Uh, they have. Uh, a, char a non-profit charity uh, organization in the UK and a special thanks for their uh, sponsorship in this research. So here we go. Um, about just a quite quick literature, about 50% of populations in the UK has been diagnosed as a neurodivergence. So it's an increasing number about the neurodivergence employees enter or in the and marketing right now, uh, because they there are as a responsibility for the employer, they need to build an inclusive um, or sustainability uh, office environment for the for all employees. So uh, that's that becomes a strong uh, point that we try to understand more the neurodivergence and the differences between the neurotypical. So in the in the study I do is talk about focus on uh, autism, uh, ADHD, uh, dyslexia and Delesia. So, um, uh, because lighting is a run of the uh, quite important building uh, environment or key factors, we need to focus on. However, this is lack of uh, guidelines and buildings uh, design standard. Uh, we use the old version with the SLL standard code. We now uh, is uh, 300 to 500 for the workplace pl on the table. Um, there are recently have the new uh, P uh, PAS6463 is coming up with a, a guidance from the British Standard Institutions that's just come up last year. 
um, for about like different lighting categories, what we focus on, as we know about them, is the illuminance. So the neurodivergent would prefer the lower illuminance, and they will quite quite feel easily to feel anxiety if the light is changing sharply. Uh, for color temperature, I think they would prefer they will have like headache or stress using so called white light, probably like five hundred uh, five thousand K. Um, thicker. There's a lot of numbers of research saying uh, people will feel uh, notice uh, the flicker from the uh, forest and lamb uh, in 60 cycles electricity. So uh, it's become the one of the factors make them feel discomfort. And also glare is uh, the other point that people will think about the neurodivergent or the neurodivergent actually will feel the same about the glare issue and also with the, the from the glare from the windows. So the hypothesis of the research is, sounds like there was a wild spectrum and more sensitive to light with responses who are neurotypical and the neurodivergence would prefer a lower illuminance level. So uh, based on the four categories, like illuminance, flicker, gear, and there are more imp impacts on the neurodivergence most. So our uh, research, sorry, oops. Uh, for the research I did, we got 50, uh, 50 participants, 25 is the neurodivergence and 25 is the normal typical. So they, they can see there is a split to see there's a total 16 as the most ADHD large group in the studies. And they also will combine with the autism or dyslexia. So how is the experiment, how we do it. So we set up in the exper experimental room in Central House, the fourth floor in the UCL campus. Uh, we used the, the DALI lighting system to control the track lights. I, I know there the image, that's quite a lot, but actually we just used two of it. So we dim down the lights and we point out to the wall to try to uh, avoid the glare issue we caused it. Uh, at the same time, the white paper will also block the daylight uh, because we just want to focus on the artificial or electric light, um, yeah, we, we, we would uh, try to avoid the daylight from the window, sorry. So uh, there are two tasks, what we need the participant do. The one is try to ask them which category will impact you most. Uh, we'll explain you what uh, we're doing or also like having an explanation for them, uh, what will impact them. And the other one, we also provide three different illuminance level to ask them and ask which level for them is suitable for them to uh, in the workspace. And the other parts of the experiment, we set up six uh, lighting conditions. Um, there are three different set of uh, during the experience in 90 seconds. For the first pattern would be like the scene A, I show, I think I showed it in the graph here. The scene A means 90 seconds, um, during these 90 seconds, 500 lux uh, would decrease slowly, steady uh, for the uh, to 200 lux. Uh, in 90 seconds. And the B is a reverse way. That means it's going up from 200 to 500. And the other set of scenes like C and D, here is this light scene C, uh, showing that during the 90 seconds, there are just only 30 seconds will increase or decrease during the 30 seconds. For the rest of the time, we just keep in steady in one the original uh, illuminance level. And for the uh, E and F, we just keep in steady 500 and 200 less. So what is going on with the light changing? Actually, we were asking the participants sit on sit on the, uh, their position and ask them to read uh, or maybe just look at the picture. We try to find a picture books to let them relax because uh, for the participant like uh, their dyslexia, probably when they read a lot of wording, they will feel anxiety. So we try to avoid this issue. Um, becomes we have a picture book for them. Once you see there are clicker on the table, once they feel the lights change, they just click the clicker and let us know uh, which seconds or which is the point they trigger them to feel this changing. So, and then also you can see there are, um, uh, of course, for the light scene, we will let the participant know the light scene start and finished. So uh, as you can see, there are lots of here. We need to check the illuminance level on the table uh, during the experiment. So this is the um, 
one of the example, we try to have some five randomized order for each, uh, for five fifty participants. Here's the one of the settings. So the blue area is the uh, one minute break for the eye adoption, and you can see the red dogs mean actually is an example showing once they feel it is the clicking time when they click it. So we try to compare every fifty participant the response time during this uh, different light scenes. So here is some selected results of the studies. Um, seems like um, uh, this is the slice scene for scene A, 500 lux uh, decreased to uh, 20, uh, 200 lux during 90 seconds. Uh, there is no uh, significant result between two groups. Um, the p-value, actually, if you can like lower than 0 0.05, that means it's statistically significant to show there are really difference between two groups. However, this is no any significant from the research for the uh, neurodivergent and neurotypical. However, there are five of the ADHD out of 16 were missing the, the, the missing the illuminance decrease, uh, even though there are there's not a significant result, but it sounds like it's looked like a trend uh, for uh, for it, it should be more uh, deeply investigated for the coming of uh, future studies. Um, this is one of the uh, interesting results we found. This got a significant result showing uh, the elements preference between two groups. Uh, there's a huge, um, there are 0 0.002, that means quite a lot of people choosing a neurodivergent. They're choosing lower illuminance compared with the neurotypical. Especially there are 200 lux, there's more, yeah, there are difference. And also there's more choosing the uh, lower illuminance compared with the neurotypical. So um, uh, the limited uh, limitation about the studies, I think this is the self-claimed, uh, we don't, uh, all participants come here and self-claims there are normal typical or neurodivergent that becomes it's not 100% can ensure they're uh, neurotypical, actually it's not a neurodivergence. And actually is, uh, you can from the numbers, there are a lot of a huge number for uh, um, to see that any trends for testing for hypothesis. Uh, and also with the, any different people of their self questionings of uh, on the effects of multitasking is also affected to the, the study. And also with the medical treatments, because there's some uh, probably ADHD participant will take a, a medicine for during their daily life. It will also impact for the studies. So for future, a portable experiment setup is uh, recommended, especially um, asking the autistic uh, participant try to come to UCL is not that easy. They try, a few of them just not so sure, then they're just denied to come. And also uh, for the computer base, uh, this study we just test about the paper base is not the computer base. So um, this paper is also should investigate it. Um, and also the specific one uh, neural uh, neuro disorder will be also one of the with larger sample size will be useful. And even though now we tested about 200 lux is the one they prefer, but how about lower than 200? Probably 100 or 50, 50 would be the one we, know, we still need to test on it. So the conclusions are really quick one. So uh, it's just a really increasing number for a neurodivergence populations in the daily life or in the in the labor market. As uh, however, we have no a significant result between the neurodivergent and neurotypical. But I'm sure there's a one step forward about how to test about they prefer like 200 lux for the illuminance in their office. And also subgroup and neurodivergence group should be more investigated. And also try to build a system stability and also with an uh, in inclusive uh, working environment, viewing system in lighting it should be used. So here is the review. So thank you for having me today. Uh, welcome for question. Please uh, send it through email. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beatrice. And uh, um, as I was saying, uh, we have the Q&A option here. So um, feel free to add uh, uh, any question there um, at attendees. And thank you so much, Beatrice. It, it was so fascinating and interesting. And uh, of course, from a, a behavioral economist perspective, uh, I, I have so many questions for you, but I will uh, reach out later. Okay, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And, uh, and great. Uh, um,
Can you remind to the attendees uh, which uh, program you have done? Oh, sorry, I'm having the uh, MSC Light and Lighting. Fantastic, which you can find, of course, in our oh, uh, website. website. <laughs> yes, and thank you so much. Thank you. And, uh, well, uh, we can continue. In the meantime, that uh, questions are arriving, uh, we uh, continue with the second presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Varsha, uh, would you be ready to start with the second presentation? Yes, I'll just share my screen. Fantastic. Is it all visible? We can see it well, yes. Thank right. you very okay. much. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Varsha, and uh, I completed my MSc in Health, Wellbeing, and Sustainable Buildings. And my dissertation topic is Assessing the Effectiveness of Passive Cooling Design Strategies to Reduce Overheating in Epilepsy Care Homes in the UK. My dissertation was completed under the guidance of my supervisor, Dr. Anna Mavrojiani. Um, according to the UK CIP report, the UK climate is becoming warmer with the Central England annual average temperatures rising on a high emission scenario in both the summer and winter periods respectively. Groups at a higher risk of overheating are especially children, elderly, people with lack of adaptation and physical disabilities. By the year 2050, the demography of the UK will be different from today with many people living longer and with a larger aging population. Any increase in overheating will have a greater significance in terms of health-related illnesses and mortality. A survey regarding the relationship between epilepsy and overheating by the Epilepsy Society has shown that 62% of the people with uncontrolled seizures experience an increase in their seizure activity during unusually hot weather. Lack of adaptation, being confined to the bed, physical disabilities, disabilities due to age, and dependence on carers affect patients in care homes. Excerpts from existing studies indicate that climate change has an impact on epilepsy either directly or indirectly. Thus, it is essential to consider health effects of indoor temperature exposure for care settings with residents experiencing health conditions, low mobility, dependence on carers which leads to spending most of their time of the day indoors and thereby affecting their health and well-being. Existing literature recommends using passive ventilation through dynamic, ventil to dynamic window opening schedules and shading through external shading devices and internal shading strategies such as blinds and shutters to prevent overheating. However, there is a gap in research currently as there is literature little literature on how to mitigate overheating in care facilities specifically designed for people with epilepsy. Thus, the aims of the studies are twofold. The first being to investigate the effectiveness of a range of passive building retrofit and operation strategies using dynamic thermal modeling to mitigate the effects of overheating and in maintaining a thermally comfortable and healthy indoor environment in care homes for people with epilepsy. The second is to examine if the passive design strategies are adequate to mitigate the risks of overheating during climate change in the future scenarios. The overarching study methodology is described in the flowchart below, which involves site visits to the care home, primary and secondary data collection, modeling of the base case, selection of current and future weather data files, selection of overheating assessment criteria, testing of passive design strategies and the impacts of climate change, and finally concludes with the formation of overheating adaptation guidelines. The first step was to visit a care home for epilepsy and understand uh, and to collect primary data and secondary data. The next step was to collect primary data uh, such as construction materials, flow plans, occupancy schedules, understand the appliance usage and window operation schedules, which were collected through on-site and, uh, and also on-site environmental conditions first set collected. Next, the secondary data used for the study consisted of a thermal comfort survey with carers and environmental monitoring using data loggers to capture the environmental conditions such as temperature and humidity levels during the summer period at the care home. Next, a baseline model is created of the care facility to replicate the real-world conditions of the care home to understand how the building performs 
uh, during a overheating period. The construction parameters collected during data collection aim to replicate the real life conditions of the care facility. Whether files selected uh, for the current and future scenarios of the current period 2050s and 2080s replicate uh, help in uh, assessing the current and future risks of overheating. Next, monitoring, uh, monitor data and thermal modeling results are compared to provide modeling robustness and provide validity for the results. After the modeling results are tested in the baseline model, numerous passive design strategies were tested to understand the impacts of each strategy in reducing overheating. There are a mix of soft and hard adaptation measures. Soft measures refer to the behavioral strategies which were cost effective with low disruption and hard measures for structural changes that which incurred costs. Finally, a list of combination strategies were tested to understand the cumulative effects of each individual strategy, which are listed below. Multiple overheating criteria were used to evaluate the risks of overheating. Some of them are SIPSI TM52, SIPSI TM59, SIPSI Guide A, and the UK HSA guidance. For, the, for this presentation, the UK HSA's overheating assessment criteria with the 26 degrees threshold is used for this study. Uh, looking, at the, uh, looking at the results for the base case analysis, it shows the current and future scenarios results. It is seen that all model rooms experience varied levels of overheating in the current scenario, and the effects of orientation and floor height also impact overheating. And overheating hours in the high emission scenarios for the years 2050s and 2080s are at least double or triple the current scenario, respectively. Next, the passive design strategies discussed previously were tested for some of the rooms in the current scenario to see the effects uh, it has on reducing overheating. For the current scenario, in the individual strategies, it is seen that night ventilation was the most effective strategy in reducing overheating, which is strategy S9, followed by strategy S6 and S7, which are shading strategies, uh, which are fixed and adaptable shading strategies. Looking at the combination strategies, the most effective strategy is C5, which is a combination of shading, ventilation, spectrally selective glazing, high albedo materials, which results in 0% of the hours overheating during the current scenario. It was also seen that all combination strategies were more effective than individual strategies in reducing overheating. So they were next tested for the climate change scenario to test their impacts on overheating. These are the results for the climate change scenarios for the uh, combination strategies. It is seen that in the future scenarios tested with the implementation of combination strategies, uh, it is seen that overheating is still present in the future, but the overheating hours are significantly reduced in comparison to the base case. This implies that the usage of passive cooling techniques aids in reduction of overheating in the climate change scenario and helps in maintaining thermally comfortable indoor temperatures. In the, these are the conclusions of the study. This study assessed the indoor overheating risks in a, in a case study care facility for people with epilepsy under the current and future climatic conditions and quantified the effectiveness of a wide range of passive design strategies to minimize overheating using dynamic thermal modeling. It was shown that maintaining indoor temperatures below the threshold of 26 degrees by the UK HSA using a combination of passive design strategies and measures could be achieved for the cl current climate. The individual strategies that have the maximum reduction of overheating while being economical were ventilation strategies such as night ventilation, passive daytime ventilation, and then followed by adaptable sh internal shading. Combination strategies using ventilation and shading were beneficial in further reduction of indoor temperatures. The most suitable combination strategy used both hard and soft measures such as ventilation shading, high effective, highly effective efficient glazing, high albedo materials, but the cost implication of such uh, refurbishment strategies might inhibit their usage. For future climate scenarios, passive strategies will help in reducing indoor temperatures, but might have to be considered in the context of hybrid cooling systems or active cooling. The findings can assist construction professionals, policy makers, and public health researchers to create guidelines for climate change adaptation for care settings. This study provides important insights regarding summertime overheating and summertime temperatures for current and 
future scenarios in care settings for epilepsy and raises queries regarding the preparedness of these facilities against extreme temperatures and climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Varsha. That was great. And uh, we also have uh, a question uh, on albedo. Uh, so um, we will uh, cover that uh, uh, as soon as we end uh, the presentations. Thanks for raising the question. Um, so um, can you remind the uh, attendees which program uh, you attended? Uh, I completed my MSc in Health, Wellbeing and Sustainable Buildings. And so ended the dissertation uh, six months ago, something like that, four, yes. five. five. Fantastic. Okay, thank you so much. Thank and uh, well, we will discuss uh, further your uh, um, your presentation uh, during the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you. And Rodrigo, how are you? Ready to start? Hello. Yes. I leave you um, the screen, Should've... so feel free to share your presentation. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Good. I'm going to. Can you see that? So yeah. Um. So part of my program. Um. Hi everyone. I did environmental design and engineering at UCL. I was part-time student, so I did the program in two years. Um. And um. Yeah. The topic of my dissertation was retrofitting proposal. A retrofitting proposal for dwelling in London, considering unintentional health consequences and energy efficiency measures. I propose this topic um, in, in collaboration with my supervisor, Hector, based on yeah my previous experience at my architectural background, and also the interest that I got during the program in terms of indoor environmental quality. And it was more an evolution that I started yeah reading about retrofitting. So a lot of things that have yeah we have heard about retrofitting. Is the elephant in the room that they, yeah, everyone should be focused based on that, for example, yeah, 80 percent of the homes have, have been already built or yeah, them the insane amount of retrofitting yeah, 28 million homes that we need to retrofit uh, until 2050. Uh, but also one of my questions was uh, in terms of how far we should we go in terms of retrofitting. Uh, all the industry and professionals is, yeah, says that whole approach, so full amount the whole approach uh, retrofitting should be the most convenient, but at the same time, um, is it that affordable? Is it that possible that uh, all the time at the same time, there are certain standards that were published in the last years. And uh, one of the important things that I also yeah, be, was aware of is the social impact of retrofitting. So there are all the parameters that can be affected by retrofitting. And the one that interests me most is that um, most of the people that can be the, the consequences of retrofitting is under the umbrella of housing associations or social affordable rents. So are all these units be able to afford and to, 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 improve, uh, to implement a, a whole approach retrofitting? Um, so, and then on the other side, another you know, yeah, line of research that thought it was, um, it's already known the, the concept of, of uh, the difference between predicted uh, energy performance and also um, the, the actual real performance of the buildings. So what happened if in retrofitting we are uh, overestimating our indoor environmental quality? So which are the, the parameters that we could uh, understand um, as, as, and, and in terms of long term? Um, because all of these elements, yeah, needs an adaptation process that yeah, requires monitoring, post-occupational, and, and developments in, in, in all the residentials. So, um, and I tested by myself first. So this is my apartment, and, and I asked my tutor during my dissertation that put two loggers, one in my living room, another one in my bedroom, and having an EPC rating is a new construct, well, 2014, but it's a, a EPC rating of B, I end up like having yeah seven months a year yeah over temperatures of 23 for, yeah 23 degrees so yeah as far as I defined yeah my house definitely would be uh, overheated yeah. and and then um, so yeah I discovered then the concept or the yeah the global concept of what what could bring yeah these con retrofitting consequences or unintended consequences something that you could be positive could be negative but they are not planned. So what is, are the consequences? 
And uh, I keep reading, thinking that the, the three most effective energy efficiency measures uh, defining retrofitting uh, increase the risk for the most reported unintended consequences in the long term that could affect uh, occupants' health. So as everyone, yeah, the fabric first approach in retrofitting, so it would be air tightness, increase the insulation and control the, the leakage and ventilation, but it might grow the, increase the, the risk for yeah, higher concentration of interpollutants, risk of mold growth, and yeah, increase the temperature, the temperature of surfaces, and then overheating. So yeah, my question uh, was, yeah, research question was into, is, are we offering a real improvement, a real yeah, mitigation in health parameters when we do an energy retrofitting, when we do a retrofitting focus on energy uh, or pursuing an energy efficiency? So just to yeah, get the, the, the answer of that, my methodology is, was quite simple. It was a yeah, description of a, of, a, of, a, of a case study, then a second stage of uh, defining, yeah, this, yeah, reading about all the retrofitting standards that were um, uh, at the moment, identifying which potential unintended consequences could happen. So from, from the implementation of these retrofitting uh, uh, measures, and then two uh, different uh, set of scenarios where steps retrofitting, uh, one following all the yeah, model standards energy as, as, as they have. Uh, that, yeah, it is recommended. And the other one, it was with the priority of mitigate these health unintended consequences. Um, uh, as we said, yeah, the parameters, yeah, that yeah, I, I calculate based on, on these um, scenarios where uh, energy, because it's still the, the, the main aim of, the, of, of retrofitting is reduce the energy consumption. But at the same time, we will be um, looking at, uh, uh, I was looking at the overheating CO2 levels in terms of indoor, yeah, indoor quality and relative humidity. After that, yeah, results were compared and yeah, conclusions done. Um, for the case study, I, I studied a collaboration with a housing association in the north of London. It was a 60 units where they have apartments and bungalows and yeah, uh, they are already uh, applying for, um, for the social housing retrofit accelerator. So it needs that they need resources, economical resources to do the retrofitting. So, um, and they need to improve it in to an EPC rating C, which is required in the, next, yeah, in the next few years. So um, uh, the typology selected was a bungalow, which by Letty guidance, it was a, yeah, a constrained typology, which yeah, a certain a minimal, iterate, yeah, minimal modifications in the environment, in their environment uh, could produce much more unintended consequences in the, and and then yeah a, a real case of for a, of a house uh, with four members was defined so um, i had to go through the original drawings uh, it's a it's an apartment a bungalow from the 80s so I, yeah do all the build ups and recognize which retrofitting implement yeah measures uh, could be possible to implement in this place in the in the in the unit and at the same time going through uh, yeah the the uh, different scenarios where medium, mid, mid, uh, minimum, medium, and maximum. And these two groups, one focus on energy and the other one in the mitigation of unintended consequences. So all these decisions then become yeah, numbers. We had to calculate fabric performances and yeah, define the family, uh, the, the members, occupancy patterns, and behavioral patterns based on openings and, and discussions with, with the people living there. And uh, results were uh, interesting. So the energy retrofit, yeah, the energy retrofitting scenarios were for, yeah, showing uh, a gradual reduction on energy on energy consumption. But um, at the same time, as yeah, it was assumed it was increasing the risk of having higher numbers of fluctuating numbers in, for example, CO two concentrations. While in the yeah, alternative approach, focus on mitigation, yeah, the reductions of the energy construction were not that yeah, significant, but still very, very, uh, very good. But the risk of getting higher numbers of, of CO2 concentrations were, were uh, yeah, smaller. Uh, we did the same for yeah, uh, moving average of yeah, relative humidity in terms of percentage. We started from yeah, a baseline already, the case study, 
in the bedrooms were already yeah quite significant. This is the times that we the, the number of times that we overpass uh, the, uh, this percentage of, of relative humidity. And as we can see in uh, scenarios based on energy retrofitting, yeah, it, it, there is a slight yeah, improvement. But at the same time, in the alternative, we tried, yeah, it, it mitigates by, uh, almost completely the, this, this um, exceedance. Um, we, um, I also compare, yeah, with yeah, overheating, the, one of the another um, unintended consequences. And overheating is something, yeah, as uh, my previous uh, um, presentation was, was saying, uh, is uh, in terms of orientation and, and location and windows opening, in, in terms of retrofitting, it's very difficult to, 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 yeah, to change. So there are certain yeah, strategies that, yeah, only few of them that you can apply. So it was very difficult to mitigate, uh, yeah, the overheated in, 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 the, in these units. And it looks much worse for the future. So an extra extra measures yeah will need to be uh, will will be required for for this. Um, and then yeah, I am, my conclusions or yeah what dropped from 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 the results um, was that still uh, yeah if it's a maximum or ambitious certain scenario whole approach a scenario of retrofitting could be yeah the the the, the most suitable. A solution for um, to 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 pursue, it. but at the same time, um, yeah, a alternative approach of retrofitting focus on or prioritizing uh, health parameters like yeah uh, mitigation of of um, unintended consequences. It show very positive results and also uh, significant uh, energy reductions because. Uh, Actually, if we think about it, yeah, it it would be yeah, it would be a bit controversial if we live in a house where where it's more energy efficiency than than healthy in terms of long term. So we need to ensure that yeah, our indoor environmental quality is 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 the maximum. So yeah, and then yeah, uh, five, yeah, just a fact of that that uh, the next energy retrofitting standard will be focusing on the unintended consequences for 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 the retrofitting. So, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rodrigo. Thanks. Uh, and uh, to all uh, attendees, if you have questions, of course, uh, you can uh, uh, write them uh, in the Q&A. And thank you very much uh, yeah, also to all the speakers to be perfectly on time. So the third in a row, we, I would hope our, uh, as, as academics being that, that uh, um, uh, tidy in our in our presentation so thank you so much rodrigo for presenting thank you and uh, um well we we can move to the last presentation now and then we will collect the q a um for for the last for the last bit of the our webinar um i can see janina uh, yeah. joining and then i'm muting so thank you very much uh, and uh, uh i can see your slides already so um, Janina was one of our uh, economics and policy for energy and environment students. So I let you present uh, uh, now and um, I can see, yeah, perfectly the screen. Perfect, yeah, thanks Lorenzo. Um, thanks for having me. So I'm Janina and as Lorenzo mentioned, I just finished the master's in economics and policy of energy and the environment last year. And um, I wrote my dissertation on um, gender equality and social inclusion or as you can see here in short, JESI in energy planning in Kenya. Um, my supervisor was Dr. Julia Tomai, and my thesis was part of the Climate Compatible Growth Program. Um, here you can see the logo on the right, and I also work for, for CCG now. So I'm gonna first introduce the CCG program, um, and then about my dissertation, explain what is the concept of JESI and why is it important to think about JESI and energy access and energy planning. Um, I'm going to describe my methods and my data collection and then present some key findings. So the Climate Compatible Growth Program is a research program funded by the UK's FCDO, and we're looking to help low and middle income countries meet their development priorities while unlocking investment in green energy and sustainable transport and also achieving the SDGs. And CCG is a consortium of several UK universities and research institutions, among them UCL, 
and we work in four partner countries at the moment, and one of them is Kenya. So looking at Jesse and energy planning, um, I first wanted to give a brief definition of what is gender equality and social inclusion. So gender equality means equal rights, responsibilities and opportunities for women, men, boys and girls, which means that any discrimination based on if someone is born female or male is removed in an ideal world. And social inclusion refers to the process of ensuring that everyone has the same rights and opportunities to take part in society, and especially thinking about marginalized groups which are excluded from participation in society in certain contexts. So different marginalized groups would be people with disabilities, um, women and girls, ethnic minorities, the youth, the elderly, um, people with a refugee background, um, the poor or the deprived, and, and also the LGBTIQ community. So looking at specifically the case of Kenya, why is it relevant to look at Jesi and um, in energy planning and energy access? So marginalized groups access and use energy differently than the mainstream consumer. They have special needs when it comes to energy. Um, so for example, in Kenya, especially in rural areas, there is traditional gender roles, which means that women have less decision-making power over household resources. They're the ones collecting the firewood, and they're the ones cooking, which exposes them to more um, indoor pollution. Um, yeah, it's just that men and women in these scenarios use energy significantly differently, which means that these kind of specific needs of women need to be addressed and accounted for in energy planning. There is also stigma about disabled people um, or elderly people as well, which may mean that they can live hidden away, which makes it harder for them to access energy or thinking about people with a refugee background who live in, in camps um, where often the energy supply is not as well organized as in other places or the energy needs are sometimes neg neglected. And we could go on and talk about other marginalized groups as well, but this is just to ex exemplify the, the special needs that, that marginalized groups have when it comes to energy. And Unfortunately, energy planning is, is too often designed in mainstream and top-down approaches, which don't account for such special needs. So in my thesis, um, in the research, we were interested in finding out to what extent Jesse is being considered in energy planning in Kenya at the moment. So kind of the status quo was the first research objective. And then the second objective was to kind of identify improvement points to um, better include Jesse in energy planning. So we um, interviewed 19 stakeholders in the energy sector. So these were energy decision makers, for example, from the national government or the county governments, but also from private sector and um, different NGOs. And we asked questions like, what do you understand by gender equality and social inclusion? So, so what is your definition of the term? Um, we also asked which of the following marginalized groups are currently not considered in energy planning, and then we showed the image here on the right with, with the different um, pictures um, for the different marginalized groups, and then people could choose which ones are not being um, considered at the moment. And then we also asked them on other questions, what could be done to improve the consideration of Jesse and energy access and energy planning? And so based on the interviews, um, I identified some key findings on the status quo of consideration of Jesse and energy planning at the moment. The first one being that energy policies and planning um, do inc increasingly include the needs of women, but other marginalized groups, which I just mentioned before, um, receive less attention. And the second key finding was that the country, uh, the county, county implementation of such policies is, um, still lacking, um, it's rather slow, and it differs between, between the counties in the sense that the capacities in the different counties for implementation and for driving Jersey inclusive energy planning is, is quite different. And then also based on the interviews, I identified six action points for improvement, so for improving the consideration of Jersey in, in energy planning. The first one being to give all marginalized groups equal attention in planning. So this is without compromising the progress that has been made on including women's needs in planning. Um, but it's essentially about leaving no one behind and acknowledging that there may be synergies um, in addressing the different marginalized groups as 
the characteristics of the different groups may intersect. Um, and so, so by um, acknowledging that all marginalized groups have special needs, this, this helps to leave no one behind in energy planning. The second point is about addressing the underlying discriminatory structures. So this is essentially about changing traditional gender, gender roles, um, improving women's decision-making power on household resources, and also empowering them economically. So um, supporting them to pursue male-dominated careers, for example, in the energy field. Um, that point is also about fighting stigma and discrimination of other marginalized groups. Um, like, for example, the elderly or the disabled people, um, and also about addressing poverty and high costs for energy consumers and um, supplying the remote living people with, with energy. The third, third action point I identified was to drive the implementation of the policies. So this means increasing county staff capacity, capacities for JESI, and also improving the collaboration between the different departments and actors, as some of my interviews have mentioned that some departments may work in silos um, and not communicate, which isn't helpful when you try to integrate gender and energy. Um, and then the fourth point is about pursuing more participatory planning. Some interviews have mentioned that it would be great to include more stakeholders earlier on in the process. And then what also has been mentioned to be really important is stronger policy making. So kind of that political will to actually drive the inclusion of Jesse in planning and then also drive implementation from both the national and also the county governments. And then the last point is about increasing funding. So the financial capital to actually put the different policies in planning and, and fund the different the different staff capacities, for example. Um, it was important to me to highlight in my thesis that um, this is not a hierarchical order of which points should be addressed first, um, but that it will be dependent on the context of each project and each county maybe, or each city, which, which of these points should be addressed first. Um, yeah, thank you. And I look forward to any questions. Thank you, Janina. That was uh, very interesting. And uh, as you can see, all the presentations were very diverse and they well describe our uh, offer in terms of programs and uh, uh, teaching, uh, postgraduate teaching at least. Uh, and thank you all for being very much on time as well. So we have uh, some questions. Um, if you have other questions, for example, for the last presentation, please feel free to uh, write them in the Q&A. A quick question uh, uh, from my end was uh, to all the uh, at the speakers that are uh, present. So which was the most difficult part uh, um, of uh, was was for you in terms of completing these dissertations, except for presenting today, I mean? Um, I could go fast if, if that's okay. Um, so I think for me it was leaving out a lot of data that I had because especially qualitative interviews can be really extensive, I think. Um, so yeah, for me the hardest thing was to kind of narrow down the analysis, I think. Um, I think what's also difficult is time management, but um, my supervisor really helped me with that and we kind of had bi-weekly meetings, I think, and she really helped me to stay on time and I had like a time plan. Um, but yeah, apart from that, it was really kind of leaving out a lot of aspects that I thought were interesting. That sets, sets up the bar for us supervisors, so very high. Thank you, Janina. Uh, Varsha? Uh, so for me, I think uh, I, uh, I found it a bit tough to like do the thermal modeling initially to calibrate the building to represent the real life scenario and make it as accurate as possible. So I think that part was a bit hard and also I think uh, the writing the dissertation also took a, a lot of time and I had to plan it in advance to be able to complete it so that I don't do it completely in the end. But I think with my supervisor, it was very easy to like work with her and complete my work on hopefully on time. Fantastic. Well, yes, uh, the result was, was fantastic. So uh, com congratulations for uh, um, succeeding uh, even in the most difficult components, of course. Okay. And what about you, Rodrigo? I think yeah, very similar to my to my cohort is uh, I think for me at the beginning it was very difficult to 
yeah, take a, such big topics and start to nail it down and detail it. But then once you get into the detail, you get interested in research and reading, you, you want more and more and more. And yeah, it's time management, what needs to put the limits. And, and, and yeah, that's where yeah, the, the supervisors are, yeah, are there to, you know, to, to guide you and to, and to try to achieve yeah, the best possible. But yeah, definitely was a yeah, discard things and, and, and focus on the point. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure that uh, Hector was a great coach on that. So <laughs> yes. uh, he helped you quite a lot. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yes. Uh, okay, we have three questions. Um, so um, we have a first question for uh, Varsha. How will be the effects and cool roof tested? Uh, so I think you were asking about the modeling. So for uh, high albedo materials of a cool of so I'm only modeled high albedo effects. So for that, I would assume that the materials with high albedo have high reflectance. So you would set the reflectance value in the material as like with a higher value. It wouldn't be zero. It would be like 0 0.8, 0 0.7 or something higher. So that would help in uh, modeling high albedo effects. Thank you. And can I ask you another question? Um, the research focused on delivering uh, room temperature below 26 degrees Celsius. But did you consider the risk of overcooling? Right. So actually, uh, the typical UK buildings are designed for cooling. So they are designed for the winter scenario and they have high insulation values, which leads to overheating because the UK temperatures are rising. So I would say that overcooling was already probably considered for existing buildings and overheating is the issue now because of climate change. So the study focused on uh, the strategies to reduce overheating in buildings, which would be the issue in the future. Fantastic. Thank you. And uh, of course, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, many other research going on on, on uh, overcooling, uh, depending on the country, but uh, this doesn't need to be the focus of uh, each uh, each research that we do or each dissertation as well. So um, sometimes they don't consider over overheating, of course. But thank you very much, Varsha. And uh, uh, I think we had the last question from uh, um, Ader. So how are the results validated? Um, what I noticed is that this question was written when, when Rodrigo was uh, um, responding my question, but I'm not sure... Uh, whether that refers to uh, Rodrigo or not. So if, if we can have a, like a follow-up on this one, um, would be great. Well, um, the validation of, for example, in my, in my case of retrofitting interventions and things, it will be the post-occupation. So put in loggers and get results, monitoring yeah, the conditions indoor. So in my case, for example, yeah, it was focused on the modeling and the prediction. So bring, bring potential consequences to the early stages of retrofitting. So now that monitoring um, in, in post-occupational yeah, uh, um, yeah, residential units, it, it can be done or, or it, it should be in order to avoid that. Um, I would say that that's a great yeah, way of validating all the results and calibrating models that we can, we can do. So, yeah. Thank you. And uh, Ader was also asking to Varsha. So, Varsha, if you can uh, follow up uh, on the same question for your presentation. Question. Um, so, if you mean, uh, to, I did a similar approach where we first placed our data loggers and then we got the results from the data loggers. And then I added that to an existing EPW file so that it would uh, reflect the real life scenario of the external temperatures and then we uh, ran the simulation to understand how the building was performing in real life and then I would compare the simulated result with the monitored data to see if the both the graphs are as similar as possible to each other and then that's how I validated my uh, modeled results. Thank you, thank you and we, we do have two questions for Janine as well. So uh, the first one is um, that you mentioned that uh, recommendations are not hierarchical, right? So in the very last uh, slide, are they interconnected? If yes, do you have a visual representation of this interconnection? That that would be a very nice uh, uh, figure to add in a possible paper, in fact. Yeah. Um, Janina. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, they are definitely interconnected and kind of dependent on each other. I, I actually meant to say that, so that's a great point. Um, so for example, the last point about financing is for sure something that will enable the increasing of staff capacity, for example. Um, I think in my dissertation, I just noted that the first point about giving all marginalized groups equal attention and planning is maybe something to always have in mind as like an underlying mindset to when you approach energy planning. But yeah, the other points and yeah, and also addressing the underlying discriminatory structures is something that needs to be done in order to enable jersey driven energy planning. So these first two points are maybe really important, like underlying points. Um, yeah, and then the others are definitely interconnected, but I did not make any visualization of that. I'm sorry, but that would be a cool thing to do, definitely. But I didn't have space or time in my thesis, unfortunately. Well, post uh, po post studies may may include this because, um, of course, uh, it it needs a, a really a really like a strong reflection. I think, um, in fact, so that uh, that was a great question. So, um, the, the, some some also was pointing out the importance of conserving eating uh, during uh, like throughout the year. Of course, in a country such as the UK, of course, uh, um. S -s -s certain period of summer are, are becoming more and more uh, like um, hot. Um, we had peaks of uh, uh, 40 uh, recently. Uh, but we have uh, a last uh, question for Yanine as well. Um, I don't know if uh, um, Yanine replied. Uh, uh, so the, it's about the, um, the availability of data yeah. when determining the research topic, yeah? Yeah, sorry, I think I just clicked on answer live and I, I don't really know what happened. <laughs> no worries, I can um, see them. Um, so um, there are two questions. One is on uh, uh, the, like the, the uh, availability of data and the second one is uh, the research focus uh, on individual stakeholder. Is there any interview for uh, on, on policy makers? Yeah. Um, yeah, so on the first question, I was really lucky because I was able to like use the network of, of the Climate Compatible Growth Programme and they've been working in Kenya since um, 2021. So they hired like a, a gender specialist in Kenya and she did some interviews and then I did some follow-up interviews and some some new interviews based on, on the, the network we were kind of able to use. Um, so yeah, that's a good question. And, and yeah, I was basically able to use that kind of the CCG network for that. Um, and then on the second question, yeah, there, there were definitely policymakers involved. So the, the individual stakeholders that I mentioned were also policymakers, as I as I said, from the national government or from the county government. Um, yeah, I hope that that helps to answer the question. So, yeah. Fantastic. Well, we arrived to the conclusion of the webinar. Uh, I'm very, very happy to see that we had so much uh, um, like success in terms of uh, um, involvement uh, and uh, attendees uh, participating, uh, raising questions. Uh, I would like to thank uh, our uh, presenters that did a great job during the dissertation and then today uh, in presenting for the department. Um, so thank you so much. And um, as we were saying in the very beginning, uh, uh, this session has been recorded. So we will also share this in our web on our website and and socials. And um, um, well, we we look forward for the next events. Of course, we have uh, we are planning uh, uh, open to public events uh, for the next month. Uh, so we will uh, uh, follow up on that uh, via socials and email. Of course, thank you everyone, and uh, have a great day.